Hi, I'm Pedro da Costa, Director of Communications at the Economic Policy Institute. Welcome to the State of Working America podcast, where we seek to elevate workers' voices to make sure they're heard in the economic policy debate, both in Washington and beyond. Today, I'm super excited to have Mickey Ray Williams, who's president of the United Steelworkers Local 12 in Gadsden, Alabama, speaking to me about his experience uh, in the manufacturing sector and, uh, and as he tells me, in the Deep South. So welcome, Mickey Ray, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm glad to be here. How are things down in Alabama these days? It's hot right now. <laughs> hot. And, and, and uh, union, yeah, tell the me. The union business is real busy. So tell me about the work that you do at USW a little bit. Give us some background. Um, I come out of rubber. Uh, I work. I work at Goodyear, where I've worked there for 17 years. I hired in in 2001, and I'm a second generation rubber worker, and I'm a second generation United Steel worker. So, you know, I joined the union nearly immediately uh, when I hired in, as soon as I could. That's great. Uh, I've got two kids at home, a 10-year-old and a 14-year-old. And I'm raising them on union wages, just like I was raised on union wages. That's wonderful. I know that makes a difference. And actually, a lot of our data shows that that makes a big difference. Some of the reports that we put out show that not only, not only do, do are union wages, uh, you know, above their non-unionized peers in various industries, uh, unions generally actually raise the wages of other, even non non-unionized workers benefit from having unions because you know the market the market rate goes up and therefore it kind of it sets a kind of it prevents wages from falling too low even in the non-unionized sector so um, how, how long did it take you to become to go from worker to activist i'm curious well i i was a union rep my dad honestly my dad was president when i hired in and so it was all in the blood I, already yeah, and I, I become a union rep nearly immediately. They had added added a lot of labor in the plant in 2001, and the shift that I ended up on, you know, there it was all new hires. So since I guess I had a connection to the union, I I was I voted in as a union rep. So it started immediately for me. So tell me what you know when I ask you what's going on in Alabama, other than the heat, uh, what. We, when we when you hear uh, people talk about the economy as booming as, as doing really well what's your experience of, of the economy there and what's your experience as far as how your sector has behaved and performed both in recent years and over the course of your experience uh, tell us a little bit about that well the economy you know it's I'm not sure that it's booming. You know, when you look at the numbers in the stock market today, you know, it may change tomorrow, but right now they look kind of dim. But as far as the manufacturer here in Goodyear, here in Gadsden, you know, I've seen the ups and downs since 2001. And actually, it was it was really a roller, it's been a roller coaster ride since before I come to work here. In 99, you know, Gadsden, they was going to cease tire production then. And due to the Firestone rollover and some shakeups up in Akron, uh, everything got turned around. And we started back building tires. So in 06, you know, the, the company was not doing, it was not in a real good financial position. So we took some cuts in 06. We actually kind of built, I feel like we built a company out uh, from, they was close to bankruptcy. I believe it. And we took cuts. You know, anybody hired in after '06, they couldn't. They couldn't get a pension. They hired in a defined contribution. Yeah. And this is this is trickled on. You know, all the way up to '13, we froze our own pension. And the reason we froze our voted to fro freeze our own pension because Goodyear has shut down plants over the years. It started. You know. In a, 02, Dunlop in Huntsville, Alabama closed. In 06, you had um, Tyler, Texas. 
and actually 06 was uh Tyler Texas was in 08 okay and then in 2011 you had Union City and there's been other plants how many Georgia. workers are we talking Mickey Ray, in, in each of these plants you know I'm not sure I, I couldn't tell you okay I, I would say between 1,500 and 2,500. Wow. Union so City was a very big plant. They produced a lot of tires there. Wow. And that was the last one that they closed. Wow. They closed it down. The city actually owned the property, and then uh, another tire manufacturer moved in there that pays, it's non-union, pays very poor wages, they tell me up there. And it's very poor working conditions inside that plant. Wow. So what have been what were the the most difficult as a as a union organizer and, and leader, what have been the most difficult fights of your career? And also most what are the most recent challenges? Like what are the, the current challenges that you're facing the most? Because it's you know, unions as you know, I don't need to tell you this, but for, for, for some of our listeners who might not know, uh, the union movement in this country has faced a lot of corporate pressures and uh, a lot of unfavorable uh, regulation and loosening of, of labor regulation that has allowed corporations to really uh, dampen uh, organization efforts by by unions. And so, I just wonder what your experience has been in in that fight, and uh, you know what the highlights and lowlights, if you will. Hey, you know, I live in the south. <laughs> Union organizing is tough in the south. Absolutely, it, it, it's. People don't understand you unions. They don't know the real truth about unions. They don't know what unions have done for this country. And they, you know, they don't want to hear. Sometimes some people don't want to know. When you try to talk to them, you know, they kind of cut you off. When they hear the word union, they kind of walk the other way. So tell me a little bit in your experience, especially coming from a union family, what what has it done for America? What has it done for yeah, America? Yeah, what have unions done for American workers, the ones that, that managed to, it, to, to benefit from it? It has invented and developed the middle class. Yeah. That's what it's done. I mean, you wouldn't have a middle class if it wasn't for unions. Yeah. And, and I'm afraid that's what we're going back to if people don't wake up. And I, and I wonder, you know, you got to wonder, are they going to wake up when our kids are in soup lines like there was in the 20s and 30s? You know, I hope that's not what it takes. That's a really important point. How bad does it need to get before people uh, recognize that they need to stand together, right, in a sense? That's right. I mean, uh, America needs to wake up and see what's going on. They need to look at this NAFTA. I mean, it's, you know, my plant where I work here now, I work at right here in Alabama, gas in Alabama, um, they built a plant in 2015 in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. And they they went down there and they started paying them workers down there between 2 and $6 an hour. Oh, my goodness. And that's not good wages down there. Goodyear, the, I, the Goodyear Icon American Company has went down there and they have established themselves as the lowest paying, in fact, Goodyear, or the lowest paying tire manufacturer in Mexico. Wow. So it's cheap labor on top of cheap labor. Yep. And now they're starting to bring the tires across the border. You know, the steel workers, we was told that that plant was built, you know, for the Brazilian and Mexican market. And there'd be very few tires come across the border. Hmm. But that's not right. We're finding them everywhere. I've got one sitting in my conference room right now that was made in Mexico in 2018. And it was sold at a, at a department store. It's like a, like a cheap, dirt cheap store. Buy right, or a, it's like a dollar store. Yeah. I walk in there and there's four tires that was built in Mexico that we used to build here in Gaston. And what's your take on, uh, you know, President Donald Trump's attempts to push back against, uh, you know, because he, he ran as president and trade was a big issue for him. And he said he was going to focus on, on workers' needs. And he started putting tariffs on things. And 
as you mentioned, the market's not looking so hot today and people are really scared of what's next. But uh, sort of what do you make of his promises and, and deliverables as a worker? Well, we're not feeling it yet now, yet down here in Gadsden. And, and that's Trump country, I imagine, in, uh, in political terms. Yes, sir, it is. Yeah. Yes, sir, it is. Um, but we're, we're still going the other way. You know, we're, we're still waiting on the promise to come true. And have you had any experiences as far as kind of the actual, uh, in terms of your ability to operate as a union? Has anything changed under this administration versus previous, or has it just been a steady kind of decline in, in membership and participation and the, the usual sort of story? Well, you know, we there's not a lot of unions in the South. Uh, you know, that's kind of a hard question to answer. Yeah. You know, our membership has, has stayed strong. We got a really good strong membership. We're we're like ninety nine point nine percent union, yeah. and we're in a right to work state. Yeah. But but our people our people know what the union does. That's pretty. Incredible. I mean, they can step they can kind of step back and take a look at what's going on in the San Luis Potosi plant that Goodyear's built down there to know what kind of corporation we work for. Yeah. I mean, they're mean and they're ugly. It's all about the dollar to them. They don't care that they got 900 employees in there with kids in, in high school and under. You know, they, they don't care nothing about that. All they look at is the numbers. So I have a question. Since given that Goodyear is being exploited, if not only, you know, with you guys, but also with the Mexican workers, is there ever any room for communication between workers themselves so that, like, because I feel like, what appeared to be missing from NAFTA, from the progressive, from the worker side, was you know worker protections and actual enforcement of worker protections, not only for American workers but for the workers that Americans would be competing against, so that the 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 playing field would be level. But of course, there's a divide and conquer strategy where, of course, the corporations are much more united in the in their front than the you know various thousand different labor groups in different areas and countries. So. How do you cross the that that uh, you know national border to actually reach out to to workers who might have similar interests? Well, you know, I, it's that's not that's not that far apart. I don't believe. Yeah. Not even here in the south where I'm at. There's not been a union meeting yet in the past year. That somebody, if I have, if I didn't bring up the the Mexican workers at that San Luis Potosi plant, somebody asked about them. Yeah. How how's that plant doing? How how's everything going down there? Yeah. Because they want them to have good wages. They want them to. We want a level playing field where we can compete. Exactly. But when you're starving them to death down there at two to six dollars an hour, there's no way. And they fired, you know. You hear people say, well, they should stand up for themselves. Right. You know, you, you, you can hear that. They did, and they fired them. Yeah. You know, Goodyear went in there and bought the cheapest union, government uh, run, and Goodyear owned union possible. I mean, the, the cheapest one out there. Well, yeah. As so and as, as, we, as weak it. as our labor laws are, Mexico is are definitely substantially weaker, so... That's yeah. kind of the problem we yeah. run into, and if we don't if we don't have an enforcement mechanism that's international and across borders, especially not, and, and we can certainly do it with our own corporations, right? Since they're in our jurisdiction, but but there doesn't right. seem to be the political will. That's right. How uh, has that's right. so? I wanted to ask you, how has your work changed over the years in the in the kind of what factories look like? Because people talk about, I often wonder. We have this debate uh, often, you know, in in the economics world and and uh, in the kind of labor market debate about like automation and factories. How big a role has automation played in your world, and and how much is that changing the face of of employment? Is it good and or bad? Is it neutral? Do people, uh, you know, does it mean that people are able to get kind of higher skilled, higher paying jobs that? That use some level of high tech. How does that? How has that played into your world? I wish I could tell you. Goodyear has failed to invest in our plant. Yeah. Since '07. Wow. 
Wow. You know, they, they they put some tire machines out there in 07, and they put a half a row of presses in probably around four, 2014, 15. And that's not much in the tire industry. Yeah. That's very little. I mean, so, you know, it's really the, the modernizations that we had through the, the – the 2006, 2007, it it did modernize. You know, it did take a little more skill there, and it helped the workers in there, it, and it helped the pay in there. But that's all we've had here in Gadsden. And I wish I could answer that question no, a little but better. No, that's that you and are answering that problem. question because the lack of investment itself is telling a story. You know, that's um, right. I mean, they're just you know they promised us you know they were going to invest when. When they built the plant in 2015, you know, in 2014, they announced they were going to build it. Uh, they told us they were going to invest in the North American uh, or the U.S. plants. And they had, they, well, they have in some, but they hadn't in Gadsden. They've left Gadsden out in the cold. Has the Canadian side affected you guys in any way, or is it just a Mexico issue? And, and what, about, what about China's role as well? Um, you know, we won a trade case with China a few years ago. It got some tariffs put on. But, you know, they I think they found ways around that. Yeah. They found ways around them tariffs. You know, it just takes time, and they figure out ways to get around they stuff. They seem pretty good at it. Yes, they are. Just getting back to a little bit to, to, to your personal life, can, can you tell me your age? Yeah, I'm 47 years old. So, you know, we, we in fact, we actually, you said you, you joined the labor market in 2001, right? Right. Yeah, that's exactly the year that I started, so. Well, this has been great, Mickey Ray. I really appreciate it. Um, this is really, really helpful, um, and uh, I hope we can continue this discussion because uh, I know I'm going to have more questions for you as, uh, as we continue with this podcast. So, thank you so much. I appreciate it, too, man. I'm really happy to be joined today by my colleague, Rob Scott. He's senior economist, and he's also our director for manufacturing and trade policy at the Economic Policy Institute. And uh, we're here to talk about trade and all of its variations. Thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So trade wars are in the news, and trade is all the rage, but we're going to talk about some, some slightly different issues today. Uh, I want to start a little bit by going back to the, the manufacturing story, to be honest, because... Mm -hmm. As, as a longtime economics reporter, we, the, the, sort of, the, the story that gets told in newsrooms across America is that people who want to bring manufacturing back are sort of dreaming a, a dream of the past, right? Right. And sort of the story that gets told is that manufacturing is dead and gone and we shouldn't fight to get it back and that we should just, you know, resign ourselves to being a services economy. I know that you have a different opinion about that and uh you've, you've given me a lot of great information to convince me about just how wrong that initial newsroom buzz was uh so first of all i just want you to tell me a broad story about what's happened to the manufacturing sector in this country in the past few decades both in terms of its uh size and role in the economy and its and, and its role in employment and in, in terms of uplifting the middle class sure well, uh, manufacturing is actually a very important, still large uh, and dynamic part of our economy. Uh, for approximately 30 years, between 1970 and 2000, uh, uh, the uh, level of employment in manufacturing was relatively uh, steady. I have a, a chart uh, called manufacturing employment, uh, which you, where you can see that. Uh, employment varied between 16 and 19 million workers, went up uh, in recoveries, down in recessions, but it was always stable at that level. And something fundamental happened around 1997, and manufacturing employment fell off a cliff. We lost about 5 million jobs uh, in the 20-year period between 1997 and, and uh, say, 2017 or 18, uh, and those jobs just have not come back. And with them, uh, we lost uh, about 90,000 factories. Uh, and this was about one-third of manufacturing capacity in the United States. Uh, these are great jobs that we've lost. These are some of the best jobs, especially for workers without a college degree. They pay much higher wages. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but also, the manufacturing sector uh, is, as I said, very dynamic. It does about two-thirds of the research and development in the United States. That contributes to 
productivity growth, which is the source of rising income for the whole economy. So it's really a very important sector. But beyond that, it has a very large footprint in the economy. Uh, manufacturing uh, consumes a huge amount of goods and services, especially high-wage services like engineering, uh, accounting services, uh, computer software and design. Um, these are all high-wage industries, even better than manufacturing. Uh, and in total, uh, when you add up everything that manufacturing both buys up and produces itself, it's responsible for about even today, one third of economic output. And in fact, it's the, uh, uh, essentially the largest private uh, economic activity in the economy. Uh, and so it really is still very important. But it could be much bigger, and this is the problem. Uh, so as manufacturing has, has declined as a share of our economy, we have gotten poor. That's well, the issue. But what happened in 97? So that was a few years after NAFTA was signed. So it wasn't an immediate NAFTA effect. And I also, I remember from seeing, I understand that after China joined the WTO, there seemed to be another cratering in manufacturing employment that followed. So what was, what happened in between there? What was? It was really two things. Uh, it was a cumulative effect uh, resulting from NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA was a, started the process in uh, 1994 when that took effect. And then in 1997, there was an Asian financial crisis. And what happened then is a large number of high power and exporting economies in Asia uh, together all fell into a financial crisis. They had borrowed too much uh, and uh, banks became reluctant to lend and, and you'll remember those days where many countries went bankrupt. And uh, they all uh, discovered that they could recover by pushing their currencies lower relative to the U.S. dollar. What this allowed them to do is increase exports very rapidly uh, and to rebuild their economies. And uh, uh, so this was the first step. Then, in 2001, uh, China was allowed and encouraged to join the World Trade Organization, and that's what really uh, pushed the crisis off the cliff. Uh, between 2001 and 2017, uh, the U.S. lost uh, 3.4 million jobs uh, to China alone due to growing trade deficits. Why is that? Well, uh, we, we had massive increase in imports that displaced domestically made manufactured goods. Uh, and furthermore, uh, we were unable to export to the rest of the world. So we couldn't make up, we couldn't pay for the imports by exporting more because China uh, was outcompeting us all around the world. Why were they able to do it? Well, over this 15-year period between 2001 and roughly 2014, China was also massively uh, intervening in currency markets, keeping its currency artificially cheap. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's basically the story. China depressed the value of its currency and became hyper-competitive that way. Uh, it, uh, we can get more into the whys and, and wherefores of, of the unfair competition, which is an essential part of this, this story. But, got to go back, we lost, uh, to, to, to the bottom line, we lost three and a half million jobs. About 75% of those were in manufacturing. So China was the single largest cause of the decline in manufacturing employment in this period. So on the issue of causality, there was a sense in the 90s uh, that globalization was this inevitable force that, that one was kind of reckless to fight against. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so could you talk a little bit about the policy choices that led to this scenario and, and whether or not they were inevitable? Well, globalization under the path that we took was certainly a policy choice. What we did, uh, beginning with the NAFTA agreement, uh, was to... Uh, create a global constitution that allowed multinational companies to essentially outsource production to low-wage countries. First began in Mexico, then it moved to China and about 20 other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, this is what led to the growing trade deficits uh, and the job losses. So we really set up the rules uh, to, to benefit multinationals. And they uh, used these rules uh, to uh, do two things. They brought in cheap imports, and they used those to bargain down uh, wages and, and the prices that suppliers were able to charge in the United States, 
And as I mentioned, we lost these 90,000 factories. Well, that's the outsourcing. Uh, some of those, many of those factories simply moved. Uh, often firms would shut down a, a production line, put the equipment on skids and say, we're going to ship this, put a big sign saying, ship to Mexico. And this became a widespread problem, especially in the auto industry. And um, they would then go to the workers and say, give us back wage concessions. Give up your health benefits, your pension benefits. And this is, this is what workers have experienced consistently for the last two decades. And that's why if you ask workers what's the most important cause of job loss, they will point their fingers at NAFTA. Although the research tell, tells us that it was really NAFTA plus, and the plus was really China and the rest of Asia. And that's a much bigger cause of these losses. When people think of manufacturing, people often think of uh, union jobs, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for good reason, because the sector was, was highly unionized. What was the role in the erosion of the erosion of, of unions, union strength in allowing all of these forces to kind of take hold? And did, did the decline of unions sort of proceed, allow the NAFTA negotiations to basically lack a, a voice from labor at that point because labor was no longer a player? How did that decline? play into the, the, the forces of the 90s and 2000s? Uh, unionization has actually peaked in the United States in the, in the 1950s, 1960s, at about a third of the labor force. It's declined steadily since then uh, due to uh, a number of factors. Uh, globalization is certainly one of them, but it's fallen now to the point where in the private sector only about 8% of workers are, rec uh, are, are members of unions. It's slightly higher in manufacturing because it's big plants and they're easier to organize. But still, it's quite low. And this is one of the things that uh, uh, manufacturers have done with globalization. They have moved unionized plants. They've closed them down and put, moved them to Mexico and to China and elsewhere. Uh, and so this is a big part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the problem. We've also had what some people refer to as uh, domestic outsourcing. Uh, uh, manufacturers will close a plant uh, in the Northeast or, or the upper Midwest where the plants are unionized and move them to the non-union South. But this whole process of, of uh, uh, plant closure and reopening is part of, it, of what's, I think, broken much of the, of the labor movement. There have been other contributors, uh, uh, as I say, the movements to the South. That really is tied to the so-called right to work movement. Uh, going back earlier into the 1960s and 70s, things like deregulation of railroads and airlines and trucking also uh, contributed. So all of those have been conscious policy choices. And what underlies this is really the growing influence of large uh, national and multinational uh, corporations. These companies have gained enormous power. They've invested bi tens of billions of dollars in lobbying in Washington. So for example, when we can go out to negotiate a trade agreement like NAFTA, with the agreement to bring China into the WTO, uh, the negotiators are advised by approximately 500 committees uh, that, that, that actually write the terms of these agreements. Roughly 95% of the members of these committees are made up of the businesses that these agreements are actually supposed to, quote unquote, regulate. Well, that's crazy. You, you've, got the, you know, you've got the regulatees dictating the rules of the game, and, and that's the problem. It's, as I said earlier, and this is a quote from EPI founder Jeff Foe, uh, these companies uh, were conspiring with trade negotiators to write a new constitution for the global economy uh, that stacked the deck against consumers and working people, and that's how we've come to the place where we are today. So, of course, trade you know, went from being a, a sort of a seen as a technical issue in economics to being a major raging political issue in a fairly quick span of time. I remember right. spending, uh, trying to not know what TPP stood for for as long as I could because I was a Fed reporter and I was, right. wasn't paying that close attention to trade and suddenly TPP was, you know, a central campaign issue that everybody kind of knows what it stands for. Sure, you want to talk about banking, and now you're talking about manufacturing and well, trade. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to talk about banking. It's just what I happened to be writing about. I actually want to talk about the role of Wall Street and financialization and maybe sapping some of the strength away from, from manufacturing. But but in terms of the, the current state of affairs, right? So, and you've, I know you've written about this in different op-eds and, and, and EPI blogs. Uh, the Trump administration 
according to your story, at least identified some of the problems, right? Correctly. Absolutely. Yes. They identified the, the sort of lack of worker protections. They identified the, the, the fact that other countries were being manipulative, according to the story that you've just outlined. But it doesn't seem like they're going about addressing the issue in any way that's very constructive. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Trump's trade policy and how it's, uh, how it's panning out? I think that we need to start with a basic understanding of what's driving our trade problems and then relate them to what Trump is doing. So I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a side trip here. Um, what's going on, I think, in, in uh, the global economy, as I said earlier, is you had this process of currency manipulation. That's really the single biggest cause of these growing trade deficits and our, our job losses. You also had... Um, all kinds of unfair trade practices. For example, uh, China and other, again, Asian countries, and some in Europe as well, were heavily subsidizing basic industries like steel and aluminum. They pay for uh, energy and raw materials. In China, particularly, they give them free land. They give them low interest loans. They may never have to pay back. So, uh, they and then uh, when companies want to move to China, they tell them, well, you have to have a local joint venture partner, and the joint venture partner has to have access to your technology, so they steal the technology that way. Uh, you know, five years later, the joint venture partner throws out uh, the domestic, uh, that is the U.S.-based multinational, and they, they produce everything themselves. So it's a uh, deeply protected market. It's in a everywhere. deeply protected market, and it's, a, it's, a, it's really a, a, a very effective state uh, uh, mercantile estate industrial policy uh, uh, yeah um, enterprising and then they're, they're practicing very sophisticated forms of industrial policy they're also willing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars that's what they spent I think it's roughly 600 billion dollars alone just developing solar and wind power industries which they now dominate yeah. worldwide and we invented those technologies uh -huh. they're gone and uh, so this is this is a problem uh, that we're confronting so we need a strategy for dealing with these. And if you step back and look at the problem, it really is a global problem. The United States has, has large trade deficits that we've de developed over many years. In fact, I have a, a chart uh, on the, uh, that we can, we can look at. We see there's a steady increase in the trade deficits since the 1970s. It goes up, it goes down. It tends to go up when the dollar rises and it goes down when the dollar falls, and that tells you that the dollar is a big determinant of what's driving the trade deficit. Uh, there are all these other problems as well, unfair trade and so on. But um, the, uh, you have to have an analysis of how we can address that problem. Now, there are, there are other countries that suffer from these trade deficits. For example, Great Britain. They've gone through many of the same things that we have. They've deindustrialized. De they have communities like we do in our own Rust Belt. You have a, uh, a British Rust Belt, and those workers reject uh, globalization. And that's one of the reasons I think the United Kingdom has taken a vote to get out of the European Union, why we have the Brexit campaign. So this is not just a U.S. problem. It's a global problem, and it needs to be addressed globally. Well, that takes us to Trump and his administration. Trump thinks everything can be reduced to a bilateral negotiating problem. And, and really, I think it's, he looks at the world as a condo salesman. <laughs> he thinks, I'm just going to, uh, you know, stick it to these people that have, that have hurt us and get them to make concessions. Uh, and let's take China, for example. China has a massively undervalued currency. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, although many economists will disagree. But China is not the only one. As I said earlier, there have been about 20 countries that have consistently undervalued their currencies. And this is why we have such a large and growing trade deficit. So if you're going to attack the currency problem, you need to address at least all of the largest unfair traders. And that would include China, Japan, which actually started this whole process even 20 years before China, Korea, and even the European Union, they also have an undervalued currency today. And for some more sophisticated reasons, we can get to later if we have time. But what we really need to do is to lower the value of the dollar against all of those countries. 
and significantly by about 25 or 30 percent. So a quick question, and, and maybe an ignorant one. If, if currency manipulation is considered an unfair trading practice, isn't that what the World Trade Organization is for? And shouldn't we be able to use that form to address, or at least to formulate a solution for that's the problem? These problems are complicated, and they require, I think, sophisticated solutions. And this is something else I don't think the Trump administration is capable of. Um, as I said earlier, currency manipulation was a major problem between about 2000 and 2014. There were, countries were spending upwards of a trillion dollars a year buying up U.S. Treasury securities and other U.S. bank uh, things like mortgage securities. In fact, they contributed to our housing crisis in the, in the 2000s uh, by making it too easy for us to, to uh, take out loans in houses. And they, built, uh, they contributed to the bubble in housing and stock prices at that time. And to some extent, it's happening again today. You see that in the stock market, which is kind of bubblish as well. Um, so uh, these global capital flows are a real uh, problem. And what's happened in the last five years is that the dollar has once again become heavily overvalued. It's now increased about 20% in value since about 2014. That has been driven largely by private money coming in. Uh, other countries aren't growing as fast as the UR, U.S. is, so they want to invest in, in particular in that U.S. stock market. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They come here, they buy stocks, they bid up the price of U.S. stocks, more people want to come into the U.S. That's how you get a bubble. And that's, again, where we are today. Well, that's what's been happening uh, for the last four or five years is private money is coming in. So it's no longer official public currency manipulation, it's private capital flows. In essence, it's the same problem. For 15 years, it was public money that was building up the price of U.S. assets. Uh, in the last five years, it's private money. But, but you, in, you can't in, make a WTO case against private you investors. You can't make a WTO case against it. But you can make an argument that the dollar is overvalued. So we need a policy designed to re reverse that. Fortunately, um, there are several ways to do that. We can, it's a, perhaps a conversation for another day, but I can I'll out, outline one. Give us a one. broad sense. Uh, the, well, the broad sense is we need to do something uh, to drive down the values dollar. Um, there are really, um, I think, uh, three ways that you could do that. Uh, in, we've done it actually twice in the past 45 years. Uh, in 1971, uh, Nixon imposed tariffs uh, on essentially everything we imported. It's called an import surcharge of about 10% uh, because the dollar at that time had become heavily overvalued. Uh, long story I won't get into, but it has to do with the Bretton Woods system that was established after the Second World, World War, which kind of stacked the deck against the United States. So we had to get out of that system. Nixon did it by imposing the surcharge. And he asked the major trading partners at the time, the so-called G5 countries, to raise the value of their currencies. And they did. Within four months, they agreed to do that. And so he took off the surcharge. So in those days, tariffs were an effective threat. We did it again in 1985. Congress threatened to impose tariffs of 25% on imports from our major trading partners. That really scared the daylights out of them. So their finance ministers, their tre treasury secretaries, equivalent of treasury secretaries, came to James Baker, who was President Reagan's treasury secretary, and they negotiated a deal. Uh, that deal reduced the value of a dollar by 25 to 30 percent over the next two years. So in the 70s and 80s, the threat of tariffs was very effective. Um, there are other reasons why these countries that we've negotiated with were uh, dependent on the U.S. for uh, defense uh, 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 protection. Uh, that really isn't the case when you think about a big country like China. So we're living in a very different world. Capital flows are also massively larger today. So uh, that's a very different problem. So I mentioned there are three ways to, to balance the dollar. We could try the tariff threat. It might work, but you would have to be willing to put a large tariff on everything we import. Uh, we import about $2.5 trillion worth of goods. So we're talking about a big piece of the economy. 
Now, let's turn it back to Trump for a second. What has he done? He is focused on putting tariffs on imports from China, one country from which we import about $500 billion worth of goods. So the, today the tariffs apply to only about 20% uh, of our imports. He's not thinking globally. He's not thinking about a global strategy for, uh, for uh, reducing the dollar. He just wants to have a fight. And frankly, I think what he's most interested in is generating press releases. He wants to, he wants to engage in this fight every day or every week and, and generate a news, another news release. And frankly, I don't think he cares in the long run if the stock market goes up and down 10% every time he does this. It's news. Yeah. He stays in the news, and it, that, makes it, that works for him. It doesn't work for American workers. It doesn't shrink our trade deficit. And in fact, while Trump has been imposing these tariffs and making all these threats, the trade deficit has been going up. It increased 10% last year. And that's starting to have an effect. Manufacturing and, employment is starting to slow down. And economic growth has been slowing as well. And economic growth has been slowing. And now people are saying this might push us into a recession. All these threats could destabilize the economy. So it's, we're certainly slowing. So um, let's go back to the currency story. How do we solve this? Uh, tariffs might work, but I think it's been difficult uh, to, do, uh, to repeat today what we did in the 70s and 80s. There are two other tools available to us. As I mentioned, uh, in the, much of the last 20 years, uh, the, current, the dollar was bid up by public purchases of U.S. dollar-denominated assets, things like treasury bills, mortgage securities. Well, we could do the same thing. We could do unto the others what they did to us. The U.S. Treasury could borrow money uh, from U.S. consumers and could buy up the, the, the government securities of China Japan, Korea, the European Union, these are all available today on the public market. They're publicly traded. Uh, that's a strategy known as countervailing currency intervention, uh, proposed by uh, Fred Bergston and Joe Gagnon from the Peterson Institute, uh, fellows that you know well. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wrote a book about this uh, two years ago. And uh, I think that they think of it primarily as a vehicle for countering government intervention. So it's something we would use when there is actually official currency manipulation going on. Well, as I said, today we have a different problem. We have this private uh, currency, uh, the private demand for dollar assets. So, But the, thankfully, I think you have a solution. For I have that. a solution, and it's just, just mine. It's a, I, there's several, I've been working with a group of colleagues on this, uh, especially... Uh, uh, John Hansen, former World Bank economist, is, and, and Joe Gagnon Gen as well. We've, he's, we've all been involved in these discussions. And there are, are a couple of tools available. The, the basic kernel of the idea is that we want to slow down these massive capital inflows into the United States. And uh, how do you do that? Well, the easiest thing to do as an economist is to tax it and make it more costly to move your capital into the United States. So uh, we have developed a proposal. John and John Hansen, in particular, is responsible for this. Uh, something he calls a market access charge, uh, which would be a fee paid every time an investor in a foreign country wanted to buy a, an asset in the U.S., a stock or a bond or real estate or even invest in a company. Now, most of those investments uh, are what we call high-frequency trading. Uh, in, uh, last year alone, uh, foreign investors purchased over $40 trillion worth of U.S. assets. So-called hot money. Hot money coming in and, and going out of the United States. Uh, the net was only was less than $1 trillion. So uh, close to 90% of this or more, actually about more than 95% of this money uh, just went in and came out within a few days or weeks. Uh, so that's the, it's the hot money that we want to slow down. So if you put in place a tax of one half or, or three quarters or even 1% on those kinds of transactions, you're going to dampen them severely. So it wouldn't take much, I think, to, to reduce that kind of excess demand for dollars. On the other hand, if, if you're Mercedes-Benz and you want to build a factory in South Carolina, uh, paying a quarter or half a point extra uh, tax on your transaction is really not going to slow that down. Uh, you're coming here because you want to 
have access to the U.S. market, you'll pay the price. That's great. Well, thank you, Rob. So I wanted to ask you one last question, which is about the role of Wall Street in all this, because I feel like uh, the growth of the financial sector has sort of taken away strength from other sectors in the economy, but it also strikes me that as you described this ca capital flows issue, uh, it sounds like part of the reason we have this imbalance is because of capital flows have become so hot and so sort of high, sort of hypercharged. Uh, and what strikes me as ironic as well is that as much as Wall Street might oppose a weaker dollar for its own reasons, uh, you know, as when I was reporting on the economy, mm -hmm. guess what indicator is other than jobs is the one that every investor cares about is the ISM manufacturing index, because they know that as small a proportion of the economy as it might be in terms of output, it's sort of fundamental to telling the macro story. But I'd love for you to, to talk about the role of, of Wall Street in, in either fomenting or opposing, fomenting the problem or opposing any solutions to it. Well, as I said earlier, I think multinationals like uh, globalization because it gives them access to cheap, cheap uh, products. You know, companies like Walmart and Amazon and and Apple were built on being having access to cheap imports. Uh, you might not think of Apple as having a cheap import. There's thousand dollar phones they're trying to sell all of us, but at the end of the day, they really are getting very cheap labor out of China and Taiwan and other countries where they produce their products. Uh, and this is why Apple is so enormously profitable. Uh, and that's the key. Uh, globalization has been hugely profitable for U.S. multinationals, and that helps explain in part why uh, there's been this enormous shift of income from working people to uh, those the wealthy, in particular to uh, multinationals. Profits as a share of uh, gross domestic product have roughly doubled over the last 20 years. So Wall Street has an invest has an interest. And in I what's assume, happened. I assume those benefits outweigh uh, the the gains to consumers from cheaper clothes at Macy's. Say, yeah, absolutely. Most of those benefits uh, actually end up uh, showing up in redistribution of income. Yes, consumers get cheaper clothes at Walmart or, or Macy's, but uh, they they lose the money. Uh, you know, out of their paycheck, <laughs> so they have less money to go to, to go to, to go to the store with. So one of the things that uh, our colleague Josh Bibbins has demonstrated is that globalization uh, has, may have contributed a small amount to growth in the economy and that the amount has re is really been vastly overstated by economists. But what we know for sure, what the textbook tells us, is that globalization has generated much more redistribution of income from the working people without a college degree to those at the top. And that's, that's what's going on here. So back to Wall Street for a moment. Uh, Wall Street loves globalization because it gives them cheap inputs. It generates uh, downward pressure on the wages of working people, and they know when wages go down, their profits, their salaries, their benefits, their stock options all go up. Uh, and, of course, this hot money coming into the U.S. bids up stock prices. Uh, that's good for, uh, for Wall Street. Uh, also, all of these transactions, the tens of trillions of dollars every year, of turnover of hot money is generating transaction fees. That's why Wall Street is so big. Wall Street has now gotten uh, so big that the financial sector is approximately equal, actually slightly larger in size than the total value of manufacturing uh, production in the economy. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what do we get for it? <laughs> That's the bottom line. That's a wonderful place to end it. So I'll leave it right there. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, and thank you for listening to the State of Working America podcast. You can get this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to the YouTube channel for EPI, the Economic Policy Institute. Thank you very much. Awesome.